My name is Brandon Benvy. I work at Mozilla on the Firefox DevTools. And I'm going to talk about Continuum, which is not this. I've just noticed there's a, I, I didn't sponsor this conference, so that's not me. Continuum is a JavaScript virtual machine, and it's written in JavaScript. It parses JavaScript code into AST, compiles the AST to bytecode, and interprets the bytecode in a runtime environment. It also has a debugger API, and it has a web interface for you know, playing around with it. And that's what you see there. So first, I'm just going to crash course on ECMAScript versions, um, because we can talk about JavaScript in general. When are, you know, it's not specific to a version, but there's, it's important to know just the basic differences here. So ES3 came out in 1999. Um, it started, I think IE 5.2 was the earliest, and you know, whatever browsers were out back then, Netscape something, five, six, I don't remember. Um, and that also is the main version of uh, ECMAScript up to IE 8, which some people are still building for now, so that's actually important. The difference between ES3, oops, uh, skipped the thing. So ES5 came out 10 years later. Um, ES4 didn't go anywhere, so that died. Um, so that is the first version of IE to have that is IE9. It's in modern engines. The biggest changes with it um, as access or properties, pro property attributes in strict mode. Um, and then ES6 is still in the works. Um, spec changes every, every, every month or every two months there's a new spec out, um, so it's still moving fast. Big changes in that are module system, proxy, uh, collections, iterators, generators, there's a lot more, but those are just the, the sort of you know, high, high notes. And that's currently being implemented in SpiderMonkey and V8 behind flags. Um, SpiderMonkey actually started implementing a lot of these things long ago, and a lot of the implementations that are in SpiderMonkey are not actually compatible with us in the spec. So there's this kind of weird thing where you have this stuff where it's like backwards or it won't be compatible, so they have to support both. Um, but they're updating quickly. So why would I do this? Why would I do create JavaScript engine in JavaScript. It seems like a crazy thing to do. Why would you do that? I actually have some pretty good reasons. First of all, experimentation with new features. Um, we can add new features to existing engines, but um, it's hard. They're most of their, they're, they're implemented in C++. They are performance oriented, so they, there's a lot of stuff in them that isn't, you know, it's not about the specification, it's about it's not about the features even, it's just about making JavaScript fast. And if you just want to play with new features and test them out, give feedback on an evolving spec, it's, it's not the route that you want to go. It, it takes so much effort to implement a new feature in an existing high performance engine that it's like, if it's not nailed down, then people don't want, the implementers don't want to add it. And even when you, if you do that, it's you're just adding it to one engine. So if the goal is to, for regular JavaScript developers to give feedback on the feature to say, oh, this is good, or we need to tweak this, they, you're only going to be able to look at it in that one engine, so you're sort of limiting yourself. And the, as the draft is, the spec is still in a draft, so it's constantly changing. Like I just read on Twitter minutes ago that apparently promises are going to be in ES6, and that was not something that was even, like yesterday I wouldn't have guessed that. So things are changing so fast, and even iterating and changing, like as the, something like, for example, generators, they've already completely changed. So in the time that the ES6 spec has been from when it was first created until now, so the and it, you can't really implement it in the engine without uh, being afraid of losing all that work or having to change and having incompatible implementations. And for personally, I wanted to learn the language like a lot. I wanted to learn it in depth. Um, JavaScript on the surface is a deceptively simple language. Or it looks decept uh, simple, but it's not. It's really easy to approach um, from a beginner standpoint. Somebody who doesn't even isn't you know familiar with programming or isn't familiar with JavaScript specifically, it's really simple to get started and to make stuff that works. 
But when you get to that intermediate level and you're trying to make bigger programs or you're trying to do more complicated things, you start to run into like the, the rough edges and the, the inconsistencies and also this, there's the depth of what's there. And it's not obvious on the surface. I think that's a credit to JavaScript that it seems so simple because it's able to hide the complexity underneath. Um, so it, I decided that implementing the spec is probably the, if I wanted to really get familiar with every single thing about it, then implementing the spec is, I mean, you have to, you have to look at every single step of every single thing in the spec and understand it to do that. So it was a sort of a journey for me to learn how to, to learn all the hundreds of, I think the, the ES6 spec is now up to almost 500 pages and it was certainly a journey going through all of those pages. Another thing is people will talk about transpilation or source to source compilation. Um, some things can be converted pretty simply. For example, here we have the uh, arrow functions in ES6, which you know, they, they translate to ES5 pretty simply, where you have the lexical this binding, which you can, you can sort of fake using bind, and then the automatic return of the, the body, just adding return. But that doesn't translate if you do some more complex things. Like if you're trying to translate from ES5 to ES3 accessors, there's no way to do that like with just a source trans, tra, um, translation. You would have to convert every single property access into a function call, and it, you would have to actually implement, implement a runtime that would check if there was a function. Blah. Basically, you would have to do what I did, which is build a JavaScript engine to do that. Um, so the same thing happens when you look at ES6 uh, proxies which you can overload and you get callbacks for every single, uh, every single action against an object, get, set, get, own property names, everything. There's no way that you can implement that without some sort of runtime, some sort of extreme transformation of the code or uh, an actual full-blown engine. And final reason was to explore new ways of debugging and visualization. So when I first created this, I didn't, I wanted to like look at things that were sort of below the surface of the engines. They don't expose things to you. Um, they don't, you can't look at what the scope of a function is, uh, like from, from JavaScript itself. You can't access that information. It's not there for you. And the developer tools for each engine are able to get around that by sort of engine specific uh, APIs that provide that information to, um, to people, to, to to secure accesses, like um, basically like Chrome code, um, it's, it's not it's it's not available to just anybody who wants to go along and make a debugger. Um, you have to have a special access, special um, priority. So, and with this, it exposes it to since the engine is in JavaScript, you have access to everything. I can look at the environments. Um, you, can see, you can see what the code that's been executed. You can look at everything. You have access to everything. And that's, that was sort of the big thing for me, was being able to look at these things. And also, I guess I could have done this with any, uh, with other stuff, but I just like to, I like colors a lot, so I really enjoyed making a thing that was super colorful. So next thing, life cycle of a line of JS from source to execution, we'll go through the different steps. First part is parsing. Um, I use Esprima, which is a parser implemented in JavaScript. Uh, I didn't make it, but it's, it's really awesome and I use it. There's a Harmony branch, which is ES6. Uh, it's still in progress, but obviously it was good enough to implement most of the, most of the um, features that were in ES6 already. And I contributed some stuff back that, to help with that. So with this, you turn a line of JavaScript or any JavaScript code into a asked. Um, it's represented as JSON here. It's so, you can serialize this simply enough. Um, and this is the, basically the tree of, you know, the syntax tree of everything that's in there. And this is enough information to, to execute. This is actually the, the beginning of the inspiration of when I, I was playing around with the source transformation in Esprima, like the uh, asked. I was like, you know, I could totally make a thing to execute this. I bet it wouldn't be too hard. Look, I could see all the different things, and it was like way harder than I expected. But, but it was still kind of like an inspiration because you can sort of see when you see those, like, oh man, it's all the pieces. That's everything in JavaScript is sort of broken down. It looks so simple and clear. So the next step is to 
compile, compile the bytecode. Walks the AST, produces bytecode, um, stack machine bytecode. So there's, there's stack machine and register machine. Stack machine's more, is simple, simpler to implement, um, and so I chose that route. And uh, you don't have to do register allocation or any, anything like that. And also, while walking the ask to produce bytecode, it also uh, implements a, uh, static semantics, which in, this, in the spec, every, uh, every production, every syntax production is broken down to static semantics and runtime semantics. Static semantics are things that you don't need to know anything about the actual, you don't, you don't need to be running the code to look at and make decisions about it. Like for example, you can't use let, you can't use the same name for let and const twice in the same scope. So you can determine that up front. You don't need to execute the code to see if it's there twice. You just have to look at it. So there's a, every, single, every single production has this like list of things that you need to check, like early errors, uh, syntax errors, but also things like figuring out what all the bound names of a function are, all the, all the uh, variable, all the functions and all the names and stuff. So that's, that's done up front um, at the same time. Instead of, instead of walking the ask multiple times, which probably about 30 to 40% of the execution time of this is walking the ast and producing the bytecode, but mostly walking the ast. So it does it all in one pass. If you do it multiple passes, it actually increases the time greatly. So you need to try to do everything at the same exact time. So here I have two example um, uh, ast node handlers, basically. So we get a, a binary expression, and every every one of these just gets the node, the, the actual node. So all of them have the same the same argument here. So. You go through the different, you have to re, recursing just basically bounces off, finds what the type of that node is, and then recurses down and keeps going, calling all the appropriate uh, handlers. And you can see the capital letters here, that's, that's uh, the bytecode emitter. So this is emitting a, byte, a get bytecode. Um, so you can see everywhere, there's, every time there's the capital letters and stuff, there's, there's this is recording, you know, at, at the current, the current co code object is recording a new bytecode. And also some of the uh, bytecodes have um, the operands for the bytecode. You can see like jtrue, jump if true, start. And a start is actually the, the um, so you can see it records the current uh, instruction position. So you know this, so you can see the, the do while loop, it'll jump from the end, if true, back to the start. So you can see this is, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to program like this stuff. It's unstructured programming, you, you're jumping around, you know. Shouldn't, can't, you're not supposed to use a uh, go to, but you have to when you're doing this kind of stuff. This is, and there's a lot of, it's, there's a lot of subtle bugs that come up where you can just go up an infinite loop and you have no idea why because you just jumped to the wrong place or something. Um, that was the thing that I had issues with when converting all of these things to, to emit bytecode. And you can see the loop here, the reason it does that is because you have to sort, you have to, um, if there's any break or continues inside of the loop, you have to jump to the right place, but you can only know where to jump after you've gotten to the end. So this goes and fix up, fixes up all the, uh, the offsets, instruction positions. Next step, let's interpret the bytecode. So each opcode that was emitted there has a corresponding function that will do what needs to be done for that opcode. Um, and it calls into the runtime as needed. Like, not everything goes into the bytecode. Some stuff needs to be done during runtime. And also, there's sort of, you can. There's a lot of things in the runtime that could be in the bytecode, but it's a, instead of writing them as bytecode and with the unstructured programming, it's actually implemented in the runtime um, to make it easier to understand. Now, if I was trying to optimize this, I would move as much stuff into bytecode emitter and then try to optimize the bytecode. But since this isn't really about optimizations, it's just, a, it's about clarity. I move some more things to the runtime than normally would be needed. Um, and there's a few specialized slots for error and return values. They don't just go off the stack. So here we have the binary, um, the uh, executes the binary opcode. So we give it a context which has all the information that we need. Um, so we get the instruction, the IP is the instruction position, SP is the stack position. Um, so we get the instruction. If we need operands, we get that from the instruction. Um, so for like a binary uh, operation, we need to know what, which operation it is. And then we grab the right, uh, the right, the right uh, value and the left value, and then we pass it off to the runtime, binary operation runtime, which 
it'll convert, if like left and right need to be converted to um, strings or whatever, that's, that happens in the runtime, that happens in the binary operation there. The result, now we don't, I, I don't, there, when you throw an error, there's no actual try, like I'm not try catching in my code. I'm, the, re, the return value, if it, it's, a, it's a, an abrupt com completion, that means there was an error and it'll have that property. So I can just check for that, and if, the, if it's a abrupt completion, then we pass off the result to the context, we put on the error slot, and then we return the next function to execute. It's just going in a loop, um, executing whatever the function returns. So here, if it's an error, we return unwind, which unwinder will figure out where we need to go, how, many, um, how much needs to be popped off before we can, or if it's not caught, then we just go, it gets thrown out to the, out of the, Everything stops. And finally, we put the result back on the stack and return the next function to call. So meanwhile, we're going to the runtime a lot. Most of the, um, most of the, op, the uh, op codes call out to the runtime because they need to do stuff. They need to, things to happen and it can't happen in, if, it's, if it didn't happen in the bytecode, it wasn't encoded in the bytecode, then it needs to be going to the runtime. The runtime implements the meta object protocol. This is like object.get, object.whatever. Um, it manipulates objects and environments, sets pro uh, properties, sets uh, variables, sets all that stuff. Manages the execution context, which is has all the information about where we're at, where we're executing, um, what's the next instruction. That's, that's managed by the runtime. So an execution context is, um, you push and pop, so it's a stack. So when you have an existing execution context, you push a new one on, like if you call a function, then that one points to, it's actually um, a linked list. So it points to the outer uh, context. So when that function f finishes, it goes back to the outer execution context. The runtime interpreter call back, call each other. So like um, when you call a function from the, from the uh, bytecode, that function, goes into the runtime, sets up the function, and then it goes back into executing the bytecode for that new function. So we're going back and forth between the runtime and the, uh, the interpreter. So the object representation is how do we represent these objects, the JavaScript objects? We, I mean, we have a host engine that has objects, and we want objects in our VM. What's the relationship? So there's an, uh, an old, older uh, JavaScript and JavaScript engine called Narcissus, which was made by Brendan Eich and some people at Mozilla, which is uh, labeled as the MetaCircular Interpreter because it puts like a very thin layer over existing objects. Like one object in the VM in Narcissus is equivalent to the one object in, in the uh, host engine, and there's not really much polish on top. It's a very thin layer. It uses, uses most of the host engine functionality without without putting too much on top, um, which can be efficient, but that requires that your host engine Im implements this stuff. If you want to implement property descriptors or accessors in ES3, then you can't do that. You can't rely on the host engine to get that information. In. So Continuum is somewhat metacircular. Like it, it reuses, for example, regular expressions. It just wraps them and it doesn't do any of that stuff. It doesn't implement that. Um, and one object in the VM is represented by at least one host engine object, but usually more. Um, and there's not a direct, there's a translation layer between getting a property, for example, in an object in the VM, it turns into function calls and stuff in the, in the actual host engine. So here is the object. This is the based object type representation. Um, so here you can see all these, all these upper case names. These are actual spec, the spec um, meta object protocol. So you can see when you create a new object, you set a prototype. It doesn't reuse, you're not using the host engine's prototype chain. You're creating your own prototype chain. So you can do whatever. You can, you can create stuff however you want. And it actually stores properties in its own representation. Since we can't we can't reuse property, we don't have property descriptor information in ES3, then we need to create our own representation. So a property list here will keep that information at the, you know, the host engine level and accessors and all that stuff. So when you want to interact with one of these objects, you see if you want to get a property from it, you can't just you know, do dot access 
like it's a regular object. You have to do dot get the key or you know, dot whatever, get own property, which will return a descriptor. And this is pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio for the actual spec. If you look at like, um, like a V8 or spider monkey, you won't see exactly this one-to-one -one re one, one -one relationship between the spec and what they've implemented. They've done things that um, either they're legacy or they just, it, it, it implements the semantics from your code level, from the code, code's point of view, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually use these same things. Since I was following the spec and I wasn't trying to optimize or anything like that, I was, I just followed the spec exactly. Although the spec has changed, so it's hard to keep up sometimes because they've been, they've been doing a lot of changes with it. Um, so if you want to manipulate a VM object from outside of the VM, you have to do, go through hoops, basically. Um, for every interpreted piece of code, there is an equivalent, much more verbose way to do the same thing outside the VM. And this is the same thing in, a, in, a, in a other, other JavaScript engines. Um, if you look at like the V8 API, it's like super verbose. I mean, you're in C++, so it's already verbose to begin with, but you have to do this extra explicit what you're, you know, what you're doing. So the, the code at the top is what you would execute inside the JavaScript VM. And that, in the, in the code at the bottom, you can see that you're actually creating a new object is like you have to spe specify which prototype it is, and you have to create the new object, and then if you want to set a property, you have to call the meta object protocol for adding that stuff. And also since I'm assigning here to just, I'm not doing a variable de declaration or whatever, it's assigning to the global object. Um, and a realm is basically, it's a set of, it's a, it's, it's a global object. So it represents the global object and all the intrinsics so associated with it. All the default stuff like object function and lots of other things like that. So the function representation is a subclass of object but uh, adds call and construct. Obviously, we need those. Um, uh, function also has code, which is, represents the byte code, also the static information that we've extracted, like uh, bound names and that kind of stuff. And also has a scope, which is the environment record. Um, this is a linked list. You'll have outer, 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 until you reach the global scope. Um, so when you create a function object to represent something, it has a scope that doesn't ever change. It's set when you first create it. This is uh, basically a, a sort of cliff notes of what the actual implementation looks like. Um, you create a function, you, you gotta you know, set the prototype and set the initialize it and stuff, set this code and the scope. Um, in the call and construct functions, you, you get an argument list, which I use an array to represent it, and the receiver is the this arg. Um, you know, if there's like a method call, it'll be the object, or it'll be like undefined if you just call a function directly. Manipulating functions is also verbose. So at the top, we're creating a foo object with an add method on it and calling it. Um, outside the VM, you have to create, actually I screwed up there, it should be new function. Um, oh no, that's correct, sorry. I create a new uh, foo object, which I'm using dollar signs here to sort of represent uh, objects that are, that are VM objects because you have to interact with them so differently that it's important to sort of differ differentiate which, what you have. Um, and so I, I cheat here since like, I, I don't want to manually create all the bytecode for this function. I can't, I don't, you know, that would be ridiculous. So I'm sort of cheating here and just using evaluate and this will return a function, an arrow function. And then I set that as add and then I call it. Refer, you have to get the function and you have to call it on the receiver. Uh, now recently in the spec they added invoke, which you could do with add one step, but I haven't implemented that. You can see here I'm passing an array of the arguments. A native function is something I added to wrap functions that are in the, out, in the, in the engine and they're not implemented, there's no, they don't have code, they weren't interpreted. And they, they don't, they're not run in the interpreter, they're just outer functions that are in the base engine, the, the host engine. So the cheat here is all you need to do is set the call property of, the, of a, a wrapper function to be the function. So whenever that function is called by some code in the interpreter, it'll call dot call and pass in the receiver and the arguments. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple to do. So an example of doing this is, so here again, we create the foo object. This time we create an add native function 
And here we're just passing a regular JavaScript function. You see a receiver and args, and then you have to you know, manually spread out the args into the names, or if you want to, to sort of uh, label them. So this will have the same result, and then you evaluate. You can call it, you can see here, we're calling it inside of the uh, virtual machine, foo.add 510, and it works. <clears throat> standard library implementation. So JavaScript has a pretty extensive standard library. Um, I think maybe like half the spec or so is the standard library. Um, this is all the stuff that you see, array, object, date, all that stuff is the JavaScript standard library. And in Continuum, it's implemented in ES6. Um, probably about a third of Continuum's code is written in ES6 and it's run every time you create a new realm, you know, glue, new global object. And, and so there's a sort of initialization time where it's got to turn through 10,000 lines of code and it builds all these objects. Um, all these interfaces, the prototypes, and their classes. Um, and this is not all of this, all the built-ins, but it's a lot of them. The screenshot. So exposing primitives to library code. Because primitives is something that's implemented in the host engine. That's implemented in ES3, basically ES6 code calling into the ES3 code. So here, this is an example of um, exposing a bound function create, which is in the spec. Um, primitive to the, in the internals module. So it's just, you can see here a receiver args and it's you know, spreading out to naming them and then it returns a new bound function. Bound function is just a function that, it's the same as a function but you set, you know, you set the properties of the target and stuff so it knows how to call the, with the bound args. Now in ES6, how do you use this? In, in my app, the actual implementation, sample implementation here of function.prototype.bind, you can see I'm importing bound function create from internals module system it's really nice. Um, and it, you can just call it like this. So you can see where at the bottom, there's the, it sort of translates up. Um, and then this is just the current function. There's actually, be, there'd be more checks and stuff, but this is just a sort of Cliff Notes version of it. And the built-in libraries, there's all of these. Um, so it's a, it's a large amount of code, even though some of them were like just wrapping um, exposed functions from the host uh, environment, it's still a significant amount of code. And that's it. Any questions? It doesn't try to optimize. Um, it does, it doesn't, it, there wouldn't really be any optimization to be done at that level. Um, because I'm not gonna store like property descriptor information. I wouldn't wanna store that in ES5, for example, I wouldn't wanna store that as part of the object. It would. I, I guess maybe I'm thinking mostly of like the, the standard lib. Oh, um, so the goal wasn't, the goal was more to like implement it stuff in, 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 in JavaScript and see what it looked like, right? So it wasn't more about performance. Like I, I could have wrapped date, but I did a full implementation of the date spec just to see what that would look like. To, you know, it's a good reference even to look at it. Um, this sort of, and that's the, that was a, another thing that I thought was useful about it was um, spreading the spec is kind of difficult. It's very, it's very thick and it's, it's, it's describing like what should happen um, based on you know backwards compatibility in this, and it, it's very verbose, and it's a lot easier to actually read like a JavaScript version implementation of it, and you're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense when the you know it's like 30 steps of like craziness, and you look at the actual implementation, it's just like a lot more simple. So that's the goal there. I didn't implement regex because I didn't want to, I didn't want to implement that whole thing, but everything else I implemented. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, there's still some bugs and whatnot, but it's 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 a little bit out of date. I think that's the biggest problem at this point because the spec has been moving so quickly, um, and it just 
there's been so many iterations and so many changes that there's some stuff that isn't, but I think most of the stuff, if you're trying to learn and you're, you just want to see how it works, I think it's a really good, good way to look at, to test some code out and get some feedback. And you, if, you, if you think about like how, if you want to use this feature, for example, or want to give feedback, feedback to TC39 or ES Discuss. Yeah, there's a few different ones, um, um, but like I think tr the most advanced at this point is probably Tracer. Uh, but still, there's there's a some there's like a certain set of features that translates relatively easy. There's a f smaller subset that translates, but is hard. Like for example, generators, and then there's a bigger subset that doesn't translate at all that you can't. Um, so if you were able to, if you're willing to limit yourself, then yes, you can definitely, I would look at Tracer. Um, there's a few others, but I don't know of any that are like have been worked on recently. Anyone else? Uh, how does this work like in the browser? Does it just like, do you look for script tags for having a funny type on them and then? Oh no. So. If you want to execute code, it doesn't like doesn't look at existing code. You have to be like, um, you have to you know load the thing and you get continuum. You can do dot continuum dot create realm, and then once you have a realm, you can do realm dot evaluate. So you're basically evaluating code, and it's not doing any smart stuff about like trying to find code. You could build that from the top, right? What's that? If, if you wanted, you could totally build that. Yeah, you could. It would, you'd be yeah. Can you talk a bit about the generators and how you implement those? Um, so generators. I basically follow the spec. Um, uh, if you wanted to tr like transpile it, uh, like a Tracer does, then you turn it into a state machine. But uh, since I actually am creating um, execution context and I have the, I can pause code as it's executing. I actually take the execution context and say when there's a yield, um, I pop the execution context, and that's saved on the function, right? So the function has like current execution context or whatever. And if you call that you know, dot next on that function, then it just pushes the co execution context back in the stack. The execution context has all of the scope information, all the local variables in the current state. So it can just, you can just do that, and that's how it's implemented. It's like a little state machine. Well, it's, it, it's like a, a, um, a generator function in my implementation is very similar to a regular function. There's almost no difference. Um, it's just the fact that a generator function can pop, it can be popped off. So, I mean, I guess it's it's not really a state machine any more than the regular function is a state machine, and that there's bytecode which you go from top to bottom. So you already, you already have bytecode in your runtime. How much more work would it be to like implement this on top of ASM.js? Um, so the main me, I've I've thought about that. That would be it. Would be possible to actually optimize it and make it do cool things at that point. The main problem there is. Uh, not the bytecode, it's the object representation. Since it is somewhat uh, metacircular and that it uses the object, I would have to represent that stuff in a, in a way that's compatible. It would be pointers and all that stuff. So that's a, that's a big part of the implementation, I think, the complexity in engines. Your own hash, your own GC. Yeah, you, you would, exactly. Like that, if, you, if you don't use uh, uh, host engine objects, then you have to implement the entire GC. You can't skip that part. <laughs> Yeah. Well, can you give us an opinion of like the ES6 filter you use? Is it faster? Is it? Oh yeah. So I it was after spending so much time working on it and implementing the whole library in ES6, I just find it really frustrating to go back to ES5. Um, I don't, there's a lot of people that don't like classes, but I really like the. I use them a lot for stuff because especially in the library where they specifically are classes. So it fits well, and it, it, it was kind of frustrating switching back to having this sort of more verbose, where you have to like implement your own like inherits kind of thing. Um, and arrow functions were a big, a big awesome thing that I enjoyed. Now, working on the Firefox Dev Tools, we actually can I can use them all the time now, so I don't miss that so much. But they're really useful to use. And I think the biggest thing, um, even though my implementation isn't correct currently, it's not the module system implementation isn't. It doesn't follow the spec because that's changed so much. The still the, the basic being able to implement to you know use imports and exports, which is basically the same, despite whatever the resolver stuff and all that's different. 
I think that's probably going to be the biggest change. And I really, really liked using the module system. It's just, it's a huge win. And it'll also fit in, I mean, everybody's using modules for different stuff. So if we can just get like source to source transpilation of like whatever require or other stuff and be able to use, I know there's a library out there I think that allows you to use the ESX module syntax and it'll, it'll convert it to whatever. And I think that, that would, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big win. Um, is there any protection that you offer from one against the other? So, to a certain extent, you can do that. Um, uh, I've experimented basically with creating a wrapper. I don't think you, if you if you're talking about old ES3 code, you can't because ES in order to implement say like existing uh, say host engine code that that accesses properties on a VM. Um, you need to use like basically a proxy or accessors at the very least, which means that you're sort of limited to newer engines, uh, you know, Spider Monkey or V8. Um, but the other way around works, where say like if you want to expose the DOM to Continuum, it's very you. All you need to do is create like custom objects that that convert you know that convert get to like actually get properties on like the wrapped object. But going the other way around is a lot more complicated if you don't have proxies, because you need to implement the entire uh, meta object protocol to allow that to happen. So there can't be a lot of people out there who've written a uh, JavaScript implementation in any degree of completeness. Yeah. Figures, figures there are. Uh, I know of three. Um, Narcissus, are you talking about JavaScript and JavaScript, or just general? JavaScript and anything. JavaScript and anything? Well, there's, I mean, you look at, Are you talking about like one person who's implemented all of it? Or are you talking about like a team of people? Or teams. Well, I mean, so like we look at every single JavaScript engine, most of them have, there's a lot of people and they have a lot of history to them. So there you, there's what, I don't know, five or six major uh, engine implementations. Um, and I know of um, three JavaScript and JavaScript implementations that are that very, Greatly, but they're at least you know implementations. So I mean, maybe that's I don't know, maybe ten total, twelve, something like that. Anybody else? How well does it run continue on itself? So there is a bug I haven't been able to find, where there is an infinite loop from the bytecode, and I cannot. It, whenever I try to, it's it's something subtle. It could, like, it parses itself and it creates all this stuff, but as soon as I try to run it, it just gets into an infinite loop in the bytecode and I cannot figure out what it is. It's, it's somewhere in S-Prima. It's some switch statement craziness. I don't know. I, I've tried for so long to get it to run it itself because it, I know it could if I could just figure out what that bug was. <laughs> Anybody else? I guess that's it. Thank you very much.